This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio on the Overseas Radio Network. You can join our conversation by calling toll-free in the U.S. and Canada at 1-855-655-2121 or by Skype at ORN Live, or you can email me at david at truthandliesradio.com. Well, remember the expression, the pot calling the kettle black? I think it's just happened internationally. The communist dictatorship ruling mainland China, responsible for the blood of more innocent victims and for more abuses than any other single regime in the world, in world history, including Hitler and Stalin, released a scathing so-called human rights report bluntly stating that America's Second Amendment protection of the right to keep and bear arms represented a violation of human rights. Apparently, this was a response to the early U.S. State Department report on abuses worldwide. The Chinese regime's document also criticized more broadly what it calls the woeful human rights record in the U.S. government. Well, there are a lot of problems with the United States government, but I don't think we need to be talked down to by those people. Such a statement from a country literally oozing with the blood of its internal opposition, just under the barbaric rule of Chairman Mao Zedong, for example, an estimated 80 million or more innocent people were murdered, tortured, and starved to death. The regime still disappears critics, prohibits the free exercise of religion, tortures dissidents and their families, forces women to have abortions to enforce its barbaric one-child policy, censors the internet, harvests body organs from opponents, and much more. But in the official report entitled Human Rights Record of the United States in 2001, released a day after the State Department published its findings on Red China, it said the United States' tarnished human rights record has left it in no state, whether on a moral, political, or legal basis, to act as the world's human rights justice. The regime said in its report, after citing multiple issues it claimed to perceive as human rights violations, While I agree that the United States government has an increasingly despicable human rights record, I resent being lectured by a regime whose leaders should all, in my opinion, be waiting their turn on death row in some maxim security prison, and I'm willing to volunteer to come and push the button that does them in. With typical red Chinese arrogance, they wrote, we hereby advise the United States government once again to look squarely at its own grave human rights problems, to stop the popular practices of taking human rights as a political instrument for interference in other countries' internal affairs, smearing other nations' images and seeking its own strategic interests, and to cease using double standards on human rights and pursuing hegemony under the pretext of human rights. Well, they talk about all kinds of things for human rights violations. The first on the list was high crime statistics and reports of teenage bullying. When in history have teenagers not bullied each other? You know, back in the old days, it used to be handled privately. Now you bring in the courts and everything else and turn it into a crime issue that could have been solved sometimes with a good spanking or some other appropriate punishment. Next on the list, with an obvious attempt to create a perception of a link with crime, was the Second Amendment. Quote, the United States prioritizes the right to keep and bear arms over the protection of citizens' lives and personal security and exercises lax firearms possession control, causing rampant gun ownership. Well, of course, they didn't mention that experts and citizens alike widely believe, based on massive amounts of data, that gun rights actually contribute to the protection of life and personal security. The report also fails to point out that murder rates in the U.S. 
are well below the global average, even possibly because of America being by far the most heavily armed nation in the world. Mexico, right next door, which bans private gun ownership, has more than three times as many murders. Switzerland, where gun ownership is basically mandatory for military age men, has among the lowest rates in the world, far less than China. And within the United States, the areas with the worst levels of gun crime, Chicago and the District of Columbia, for example, tend to have the strictest gun measures. You know, of course, they want to attack America's right to have guns because they want to weaken America because they've gone into this alliance with the Soviet or the Russia, excuse me, but with Putin running it, you might as well call it the Soviet Union in many respects. And they're not content with merely undermining America's economic power, which America deserves. America did it to itself. But they want America to disarm its people so that if necessary, China can solve its population problem by filling up North America, too. You know, China calls itself the Middle Kingdom. Still, it's pretty funny, a communist country calling itself the Middle Kingdom. Until you understand what they mean by the Middle Kingdom. They call themselves the Middle Kingdom because only heaven is above them and the rest of the earth is beneath them. The Red Chinese regime is among the most despicable in the history of the world. And with all of America's problems, which I expose every day, China still is much worse. And if Americans give up their guns or have their guns taken away, then the last defense the American people have, what George Washington called the people's liberties teeth, their arms will be gone. And with a megalomaniac in the White House with unlimited power in league with this evil in China, America, as we know it, or as we remember it, will completely cease to exist. If you think it's tough now, it's going to get tougher. And an example of that, Mr. Obama is threatening to veto the NDA version 2013. It's, you know, it's almost like a software, you know, NDAA 2000.13. Because it says it has too many restrictions on his exclusive authority. As if he doesn't have enough power, Obama's bitching. He says a number of bills provide, a number of the bill's provisions raise additional constitutional concerns, including encroachment on the president's exclusive authorities related to international negotiations. I don't remember any such authorities. In fact, the Constitution, I remember, says that the president's authority in international negotiations are bounded by the advice and consent of the United States Senate, two-thirds vote of the United States Senate, in treaties. But he's whining because he doesn't have enough power yet. Ironically, there is a considerable constitutional concern in the president's complaint. In the last paragraph of the document, the White House asserts that the president has exclusive authorities over international relations, apparently meaning treaties. But Article 2 of the Constitution explicitly says the president shall have the power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make pre treaties provided two thirds of the senators president concur, as he's done in so many other areas Obama is trying to actively banish from the arena all of those, including the people's representatives in Congress, who would challenge his right to absolute rule. First, there's the provision to proposed update of the NDA that places restrictions of the president's power to implement the new START treaty. Again, the president incorrectly calls the Constitution a witness for his case. 
The White House insists that the president's authority as commander in chief includes the right to set nuclear employment policy. Well, no, the Constitution gives Congress the right to declare war. He's just commander in chief under congressional law. Well, once again, we'll have to break for a word from our sponsors, but this story will continue when we come back. So please stay tuned. I'll be back in three and a half minutes. This is David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio on the Overseas Radio Network. You're tuned in to Overseas. David Finzer for Truth and Lies Radio on the Overseas Radio Network. We were talking about how the America's Fuhrer was complaining that uh, NDAA 20.13 infringes on his rights. Specifically, now we're talking about the new START Treaty, which was signed by Mr. Obama and then Russian President Medvedev in April 2010, the aim of which ostensibly is to reduce by half the number of strategic nuclear missile launchers and sets the permissible number of deployed strategic nuclear warheads at 1,550. First of all, these treaties don't ever work. They usually cause wars. They don't They don't prevent them because one side always cheats. Of course, it's hard to tell the good guys from the bad guys when you've got Putin on one side and Obama on the other. So it's sort of like the uh, Ribbentrop, uh, von Ribbentrop, Molotov pact between Hitler and Stalin. You've got two bad guys making a treaty and just waiting to see who's going to break it. In Obama's policy complaint, he assumes absolute power to make treaties and to unilaterally decide how these treaties will be implemented. Neither of these alleged powers has any constitutional foundation whatsoever. Finally, when it comes to the president's self-appointed role of judge, jury, and executioner, the statement warns that certain provisions present in this NDAA latest updated new and improved version infringe upon, quote, the executive branch's ability to carry out its military, national security, and foreign relations activities. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. There is no declaration of war against anyone. There is no judicial process involved here. It's not been submitted to the the Senate, has never approved this as a treaty. And the president or the guy who's playing president is saying he needs more power. He can sit down every Tuesday and decide who he's going to kill. He can at whim imprison without trial, counsel, right of habeas corpus, any American citizen that he deems a belligerent, and he wants more power. The only thing left to do for Congress is what the Reichstag did for Hitler, which is give him sole power to make all legislation and then permanently adjourn. I mean, this is incredible. And the fact that the American people are standing by, they're even debating this stuff and aren't up in arms picketing. Washington should be filled with people demanding our freedom back, demanding that the dictator be taken out of office. He ought to be burned in effigy in every town and countryside in the United States because this man is the, I thought George Bush, Bush. George W. Bush was as bad as it could get, but I was wrong. Barack Hussein Obama is just dictatorial and a megalomaniac and evil. And he's also two-sided and a hypocrite. He's just signed a bill reauthorizing a program he once called corporate welfare. Is the Export-Import Bank corporate welfare, or is it critical support for American businesses? According to Mr. Obama, it's both, depending upon which side of the mouth he's talking of. 
Back in 2008, then-Senator Obama denounced the Exim Bank as a government program that should be cut back because it it had become little more than a fund for corporate welfare. But just last week, now the Obama in the White House signed a bill not only extending the bank's charter for two more years, but also increasing the amount of money it can loan by 40%. He said, by reauthorizing support for the Export-Import Bank, we're helping thousands of businesses sell more of their products and services overseas, and in the process, we're helping them create jobs here at home. And we're doing that at no extra cost to the taxpayer. Well, the Export-Import Bank may not be costing taxpayers extra today, but there's no guarantee that that will be the case tomorrow. The bank provides loans and loan guarantees to foreign governments or companies for the purchase of products and services from U.S. companies. At least companies are incorporated in the U.S. They may be foreign-owned, but they are incorporated in the U.S. These loans, by the way, are handed out by the Export-Import Bank because the private sector has decided they're too risky. When you consider the kinds of investments that J.P. Morgan has made and the other big banks, they've got to be damned risky. While politicians and bureaucrats have no such qualms about tossing other people's money about with abandon. Although the bank was originally funded by U.S. taxpayers, as always, today it's self-funded, allegedly, spending only the money it receives from loan repayments and fees. But then, so was Fannie Mae, until the housing market collapsed. And we know the world economy is on the verge of collapse. So thus, while Obama is technically, in this one very limited case, correct that the taxpayers aren't being soaked for the bank's new loans, that situation could change overnight. And now the American taxpayer will be on the hook for even more money, $140 billion, as opposed to the old limit of $100 billion. It's incredible. I just sitting here outside the United States looking in and I can't believe it. It's like watching a horror movie. It's like watching the Terminator from the beginning in slow motion as the United States is destroyed and morphed into something that was great and good and has become something scary and evil. Now, one of the supposedly smartest investors in the world, I think is stupid now, Warren Buffett says, despite recent signs of weakness, the U.S. economy isn't likely to slip back into a recession. He also says both political parties deserve blame for the federal government's failure to reduce the deficit. Speaking at the 25th anniversary dinner of the Economic Club of Washington late Tuesday, the billionaire investor says he sees the odds of a renewed recession as very low. But he warned that could change if the effects of Europe's financial crisis were to spill over in a big way. How can Europe's financial crisis not spill over? You know, if I weren't... You know, six foot four, if I was, uh, uh, that I wouldn't be over. If I was seven foot two instead of six foot four, I wouldn't be overweight, but I'm not. So I'm fat. But he warned that he could change things if the U.S. government reduces its deficit. And he says the way to do that is raising taxes and cutting spending, especially, of course, raising taxes on people who are productive and make money. This is like looking into Alice in Wonderland through the looking glass where nothing makes sense, where up is down and down is up. It's almost like the president of the United States and the people around him have read Orwell's 1984, not as a book to scare them, but as a textbook by which to govern the United States. And I'm scared and I'm here. I'm 
a long way from their reach because I live in a country that doesn't particularly like America since America bombed it, committed war crimes against it, invaded it with no, with, without a declaration of war, violating the NATO charter, killed, maimed, and poisoned people, used spent uranium bullets that are still causing people to not be able to have children and have a high rate of cancer. So I'm a little bit safe here, probably not from a drone, but people still, most Americans don't even have a passport, much less a second passport. They don't have a foreign bank account. They don't have anything outside the United States. They have taken all of they have and they have risked it that somehow God is going to come out of the sky as he will one day and save America from itself. The problem is, my fellow Americans, we don't as a nation deserve it. We have supinely laid back and been more concerned about football games, and I know that's almost a religion in some parts of the country, and reality TV and all kinds of self-indulgence while essential liberty has been taken away. We have endured being treated like criminals every time we get on an airplane while the United President, man acting as president of the United States without any consent of anyone, kills whomever he wants around the world. We see our economy going to hell. Our mortgages are upside down. Our dollar is dropping in value. We're losing on every front. We're being laughed at by the world. And there will be no Marshall Plan for the United States. No one's going to come to help save the United States. And yet we're doing nothing. And I cannot understand why. Think about it. Now we're at the top of the hour. So I'll be gone for about eight minutes. But I'll be back tell more truth and law about truth and lies this is david finzer for the overseas radio network on truth and lies radio